I wanted to talk about today, since our topic is leadership, um, is a lot of people in our community are attempting to cause cause change in an organization. Change agents is kind of the, the buzzword. And that's who I'm targeting, especially people who are trying to uh, facilitate change within an organization, which uh, I believe is probably most of you. And it's always been a topic of how do I do that is always been a topic uh, for decades that uh, people have been uh, been debating. And I wanted to go through some things that I've seen in my experience that I am pretty sure are guaranteed to fail pretty much every time you try it. And then some principles about what maybe uh, we can try instead. Uh, that being said, this is this is always a work in progress. This is what I'm thinking today. And um, if we get into a good conversation, we may find that I'll change my mind about something, but that's kind of the way this goes. So me, hello, there we go. So let's start with our key challenge. And this is gonna be a little geeky, but I think it's important to at least understand um, is that we have in the lean and in other, other approaches to continuous improvement, at least the ones that work, something which is referred to as causal ambiguity. And really what we mean by that, if I were to look at a typical continuous improvement culture, especially in the, in the TPS model, we've got the, you know, the tools that we, if we walk through the facility, if we look at the organization, we're going to see certain, th certain artifacts, certain activities going on. And we're going to say, oh yeah, that's it. And then, but really underneath the surface there is we're working to develop teams that can quickly solve problems. Now, where this becomes challenging is that when I have that culture, that somehow produces tangible business results. But it's difficult to articulate exactly how this culture produces the tangible business results. By that, I mean not whether they do, because that's really undisputable. If you look at companies that do this well, they perform really well. But how does this, these things that we can see and how does this thing that we say we're trying to do of developing teams that quickly solve, how does that actually produce the tangible business results? It can be difficult to actually make a direct causal link, at least a direct logical link. And we can see that in sports too. Well, uh, we have really good teamwork, therefore we win more games. But if you try to watch exactly how really good teamwork, which we know we have, develops into more wins, the exact mechanism of cause is a little hard to see. On the other hand, I can't think of any organization that would say no to, hey, we want better teamwork. But getting that to tangible business results can be a little tricky. And this can make a hard sell to this change process that often, not always, but often involves large, long, expensive efforts. Now, I took this, interestingly enough, from an article I found that was really about General Motors' experience with Numi. And if you think about what General Motors had, they had their own benchmark factory. They could go to at any time and look at it. And even then, GM struggled for over a decade before even the concept that this is really interesting and we maybe want to look at it started to become less than rejected outright. So it's a challenge. So these things can conspire and they can make it difficult or impossible to just copy another company's approach. And this is important because even though that is the case, yet we try. So let's look at an example. This is a real live company that, um, and their, their lean initiative came from corporate and they had programs. And these programs were, okay, we're gonna have a 5S program, a zero defects program, on and on and on. I was brought in to kind of help with the Toyota Kata program. And I didn't know when I went in there what the, what the, uh, the history had been. And when I started talking to the, this plant leadership team, 
what I got from the plant manager is, yeah, this is just another thing being forced down our throats. So because they were about compliance with the so-called standards and they were auditing people, what they created, there was resistance from the very management team that they depend on for success. This is something which I see over and over and over again of just trying to deploy the tools and maybe not as, as heavy handedly as this case, but just deploy the tools and audit them into place and then wondering why they don't take hold as a culture change. So the key here is this is not a technical process that you implement. This is a process of social learning. And that's for any major change. It doesn't matter whether it's the lean or, um, God, I can't even think of the other buzzwords out there, but if you're trying to, you know, high performance organization, we want to become a learning organization, all of the things out there around changing the way people habitually interact. This is a process of social learning because you've got to engage groups of people, not individuals. And so I got to look at what are we going to look at? What are the things that typically inhibit that social learning process and create resistance along the way? So to get to that, I'm going to borrow the model from um, uh, 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 Everett Rogers. And then it was, um, it was um, kind of reinvigorated by uh, Jeffrey Moore in, uh, in crossing the chasm, but it's, a, it's about, but we've all seen the innovation curve or the change curve in any organization. You can generally look at groups. You have what are uh, some people call the uh, um, the pioneers or the uh, the innovators or the people who first see the idea. You have the people who say, hey, this is cool, the early adopters. You've got the kind of the, uh, I think what Everett Rogers calls the uh, um, um, the early majority, I, I like the word pragmatists, uh, the late majority or the conservatives. And I don't like the word laggards because I don't think there are laggards, but I call them the skeptics. And each of these groups of people in your organization tends to look at a new thing through a slightly different lens. Now, if you're watching this, you're likely in these groups here. And I want to make that clear, you're going to, you're likely to be taking the perspective that, hey, this is cool. Now, the other thing that what, what Jeffrey, um, anyway, um, is the introduction of the chasm. And I'd like to call it the gap because I don't think it's as wide as a chasm, but getting, getting the change past that gap can be daunting because your messaging has to change. So here, this is interesting. This is new. I want to be a part of it is kind of the motivation here for these early groups. And they're willing to put in the time and effort to learn something that and to try something and to learn through experimentation and to get it wrong to um, in order to uh, become competent at it here. You've got, hey, this could be helpful. Can you tell me more? So maybe you're starting to get some curiosity, but only after the validity of the concept has been established. These guys don't want to do the work to figure it out. They would like to be given a working product. Over here, you he says you move to the right, what you get is people who are more and more inclined to learn from their immediate peer group rather than from outsiders. And then on this group, you get the what about, what about, what about this, what about that? And what they're just going to be asking those questions and they're legitimate questions, but they want to have every, every risk understood and they'll come on board once the rest of the organization is just doing it that way. So the key here is this is a social process and you want to work to connect people as you go. So as a change agent, what you're trying to do is you are trying to avoid pushing people to the right. And you are working to pull them to the left. And notice here, I said relationships. 
So think about for a second some of the approaches that we take. For example, it's very common to roll out mass education and teach everybody this thing, this new thing we're going to do and say we are changing it all and this is the new way. That education typically raises a lot more questions than it answers because you can't answer all the questions and you can't answer the how does this work and you can't answer the how does it handle this and how does it handle that in a classroom environment, not in a way that convinces people and you start conversations. And people who are pushed back in a conversation tend to look for people that agree with them. And what you're going to get is you are going to amplify the message from this side of the uh, this side of the curve. And the people over here aren't going to have the answers that they need to counter the legitimate questions that are being raised. If you push people back and you tell them everything we're doing is bad, they're going to disagree with you and they're going to look for people that agree and you're going to end up creating resistance as you go. So what we want to try to do is pull people to the left and work very hard to avoid pushing them to the right. So here's some ways to push people to the right. One is to use fear as a motivator. We have this thing, seize or create a crisis. I've read that in so many books. No, don't do that. You have, uh, we want to have to create a burning platform. Uh, look at that platform. It's on fire. Does anybody on there say, hey, this is time to reevaluate how we did business? No, they don't want to get off the platform. That's it. This is fear. Fear isolates people. It does not bring them together. Now, if there's a true existential crisis for the organization, deal with it. But fear does not create teamwork. Only leadership does. And the best example that I can think of in more or less recent history, if we look at uh, Ford Motor Company, actually it's before the Great Recession back uh, 15 years ago now, when they uh, finally said, okay, uh, we can't dig ourselves out of this hole that's getting deeper and deeper. We need to bring in somebody from outside. And, uh, and I got to say that, you know, Bill Ford had the, the humility to say, uh, I can't do this, we can't do this. And they went and they got Alan Mulally from Boeing. And he came in as CEO. And the first thing he worked on was creating teamwork in his direct reports. And this was daunting because there wasn't. It was, a, it was a group of very isolated people who literally worked to, uh, worked against one another. And he worked very pragmatically to get them all operating from one, one common picture of the truth and every week meeting and discussing where are we versus where we're trying to go, what problems have come up, who can help and got them engaging in dialogue as a group and tackling the problems one by one. Once they accepted the truth, then they could handle it. Now, they almost didn't make it. There were some lucky breaks, but that was the only thing that would have saved them was bringing in teamwork. And what he had to do was take fear out of the equation and just say, We're, we can do this. We have faith. It's going to be tough. We have to deal with the truth as, as it comes to us. That's the difference between create a burning platform and actual leadership. So force change onto people. And I use this picture because the harder we push, the bigger the mound that ends up in front of us. Um, so, you know, your typical mass change program uh, I was in a large company that rolled out that mass education. Uh, they literally first taught it to every manager and then somebody had the idea and it was great to uh, deploy it to everybody else. And they painted this really rosy picture of a future company, but it very clearly wasn't the company that we were in on the outside of the classroom door. And what I'm going to say is that that probably created more backlash than convert converts. So the other piece here is when you start emphasizing compliance rather than learning. So I'm going to audit you. I'm going to have a, a lean assessment uh, and on a scale of one to five, I'm going to rate you on all of these tools. And then I'm going to beat you over the head with why aren't you a four? Um, 
One of my mentors had an interesting thought on that on a one to five scale, everybody's a two. He, he said, because by the time you start to think you're a three, you realize how much further five actually is. Um, you get goals that are based on the depth of tools implementation. And then you get people, change agents that try to appeal to authority. They try to say, well, how can I make these leaders support the changes? All of that, all those things do is push people back, create more resistance than you, uh, than you, than you uh, uh, overcome. And then always compare everything and everyone to us to perfection. Well, what's wrong with this shadow board? And you look at that, uh, you look at this classic 5S example as uh, I'm going to audit you and I'm going to show you everything you're doing wrong. Again, people don't like to hear that. Uh, one of my favorites is the what would Toyota do mantra that we, that even, you know, I think everybody passes through that phase. Well, at Toyota, they, and then you, you tend to espouse some, some kind of behavior pattern that you think is ideal. I always ask, have you actually worked there for any period of time? Because it probably isn't as perfect as you envision. Um, but that's kind of a sidebar. Uh, point out waste every day. Well, look at all this waste. You're doing this, you're doing that. Make them wrong. It's guaranteed to back them up and have them coalesce around the status quo. Um, expect them to apply as experts after superficial training. This is one of my favorites. Hey, we gave you a class. Why don't you do it? Well, all classroom training is superficial. You have to learn this stuff in the trenches. You have to learn it by doing. That's not just lean. I can tell you the same thing in a Six Sigma culture. Uh, we, I worked in a huge company, had 1,100 black belts, and they made almost no progress. They put, um, they put all of their... Um, they, they had a program to put all kinds of uh, middle managers through green belt training and they get the certification on the wall. But for the most part, it was because it was on their performance review. So let's now look at what can we do. So the first th thing is pull the willing towards you. And the key word here is willing. So You've got to create psychological safety to engage in the new way. Now, what does that really mean is you're doing as a change agent almost one by one on one engagement with the people who are most interested. And you are working to create relationships that are based on their choices and working to build a sense of competence. We can do this. So the psychological safety here, as you move to the right on this diagram, what you really can see is that the groups need higher levels of psychological safety of knowing this is okay, of knowing it's not gonna blow up in my face before they're going to begin to engage. And you've gotta recognize that if you're playing over here, this is where you are, you feel fine with it. You're willing to take some risks and try stuff out. As you move to the right, you get less and less of that willing to take some risks and try stuff out mindset. And this is all legitimate. I mean, these people here are looking after what they believe are the vested interests in the organization. They don't want to break anything. They don't want to impact the delivery to customers. They don't want to make anything worse. And there can be a real fear that that will take place. So why? Because they don't have an in-depth understanding and you only get the in-depth understanding by trying it. And that's kind of the catch-22 here. So, this is important. This is critical. Building relatedness, building a sense of choice, building a sense of competence. So what we want to do is in every interaction that you have with anyone, really think about, did I, in the course of this conversation, enhance or diminish their sense of relatedness, their sense of connection with the organization, connection with me, connection with people who are important to them, or am I isolating them? You know, if I, uh, uh, if they have to embrace this and, and end up with peer pressure, 
that's going to be an uphill battle. So you got to have some way for that to be replaced. Uh, am I diminishing or enhancing their sense of choice, their sense of autonomy, that their sense that they are embracing this new way because they want to rather than, than because they have to? If you try to force them to do it, they are going to at best comply when you're looking. And we see that in the audit cultures. Are you enhancing or diminishing their sense of competence that I know what to do, that I can handle this? So what does that mean? If you expect perfection from the very beginning, you are, you are pushing them to uh, pushing them into a, a, a sense where they don't know what they're doing. And some people will dig in and try to learn. A lot of people will just go back to what they're comfortable with. Learning takes place on the edge of competence. It doesn't take place when you're way deep into what you don't know, nor does it take place when you're just overdoing, repeating what you already know. Learning takes place at the edge, at the th what we in Kata call the threshold of knowledge. And you've got to be operating there. And as a change agent, you've got to know where that is for the individual you're dealing with. And as you are promoting change, you just need to be nudging that threshold of knowledge a little bit further and a little bit further. So if you're just getting started with somebody, work on relatedness first, because unless there is trust, unless there is a sense of choice, they aren't going to listen to anything you say. So work on building trust as your very first priority. That is crucial. Building trust, building a sense that we're in this together, then you can start working on the other stuff. If you try to slam straight to the technical stuff, you are going to diminish that sense of trust. You're going to blindside people. And in doing so, um, it's going to be a challenge. Okay, principle two, start where they are. So you are going to borrow from Stephen Covey. Seek first to understand what are the things we do well? What are the competencies in the organization? What's the pattern of interrelationships in the organization? Who supports who psychologically? The psychological groups, the, the network groups are very likely not the org chart. So you've got to understand or at least take a little bit of time to understand, you know, who's uh, who are the factions and where the psychological support comes from. And then and then what are the perceived problems? Where are the places where they know they want to do something different, but they don't know how? So look for gaps in competence. Look for gaps in relatedness. Look for gaps in, uh, um, in autonomy. Look for places where you can, uh, you can leverage, but always honor what has already been done. Acknowledge and honor the work that has been done. This is really important. In other words, work to build up on the prior effort versus, well, you've been doing it all wrong. Let me show you the new way. That is a really good way to turn everybody off, especially if they have been working together for a long time. So that kind of brings us to a principle that I kind of call camouflage, that I'm you know, using as much of the existing structure as you possibly can. And I call this make doing a new thing look like or sound like just an adjustment to what they've already been doing. So adopt the existing language. Don't introduce a whole bunch of new jargon. Uh, adopt as much as you can existing process structure. If there's already meetings that are taking place at the time of day you need them to take place, then make an adjustment to how the meeting runs rather than introducing a brand new meeting. I call that adjusting the targeting mechanism. You've already got something that is working. It's already bringing people to change, already, I mean, bringing people together. If you can make a small adjustment to the way they have the conversation, you can make a big change without making big changes. What do they expect to see? Work hard to make what you're doing look like that. Make the disruption you make as small as you possibly can. So, for example, one organization um, 
uh, they had a, another one that had a, a corporate uh, CI program. Well, this Toyota Kata thing was new from with a local company. So they just called it there. We're going to develop our coaches and we're going to use the, the standard of a Kaizen newspaper, but we're going to add these other columns on it. And that looks cool. Uh, and we've got a daily huddle board and they just kind of started to repurpose that. It didn't look exactly like the storyboard starter Kata, but it accomplished the same purpose. And by simply adopting the conversations they already had and adopting the terminology that was out of the corporate CI program, they were able to get this daily coaching process started. And that's what's important. Don't lose sight of the objective. Okay. The fourth principle is as a change agent, what you can, where you can. So, you want to work to create an active network of people who are interested and engaged. This is really important because what we tend to do is we tend to say, well, Joe there is, isn't getting it. And we tend to spend a lot of time trying to bring along the people on the far right hand side of that curve without and it diminishes the attention that we pay to the people who are genuinely interested. Don't worry, trust the process, trust the people, trust the social, the social network. It will bring the people along. You work with the people who are interested and engaging in what you're trying to do. And as that group grows, you'll get more interest as it goes. You want to build alliances and networks within the organization. And the key point here is teamwork isn't a thing. You can't go and say, well, we need to have teamwork. You can't teach classes on teamwork. You can work to change the patterns of interaction between people. And by working to create clarity in what the group is trying to do, by working to develop their skills, not only at handling the issues, but their skills at dealing with one another and working to, um, working to build the trust within the group, you get teamwork as an outcome. So this is one of those indirect things. If you want teamwork, you've got to work on clarity, skills, trust within a group that you want to be a team, get them all operating on a single, a single uh, depiction of the truth. They all agree this is what's happening. And once you're there, what are we going to do about it becomes a much easier conversation. I see so many groups that debate and debate. And when you're listening to them is they're all advocating solutions, but they're all advocating solutions to different problems because they haven't yet agreed on what's actually happening and they haven't agreed on what the problem is. Once there's agreement on the problem we're trying to solve and there's agreement on what's actually happening now, and you can get transparency in that discussion, which means you have to take fear out of the conversation teamwork kind of starts to click into place. Okay, reinforce success. This kind of goes with that last one of don't beat your head on the resistance, right? You want to put your support behind people who are making the most effort and the most progress. You want to keep strengthening those relationships and that trust and build mutually supporting connections between the group. So as a change agent, hey, uh, Sarah over over here is working on something similar. Get them to talk to each other. Get them in a conversation so that they can begin to ask and answer their own questions. Hey, have you tried this? Let me show you what I did. And you start again now to build networks of networks within the organization. And this is how you can start to engage the pragmatists because they will come along when they see their peers are working on things that are solving problems that are similar to the ones that they have. The key here is stay engaged. And I'm going to give you the opposite of this, which is you know, a program that just does Kaizen events and that's all they do. And I look at that and what I see is we're going to drop in. We're going to make a massive amount of change in one area and then the, the experts are going to move on and the engagement with the team that did all the work is at best asking them why they're not completing all the ac action items that came out of the event. And that's a great way to have it die in place. 
You've got to stay engaged. The problems are going to come up and then you can use those opportunities to create conversations with other peer leaders who have encountered things similar or get them working together on it. And then you start to build up those relationships. And finally, focus on progress, not perfection. So, hey, was there any effort today? Perfect. Was there an experiment? Was an experiment tried today? Perfect. Was there any learning today? Do we learn anything today? Perfect. I'm not about perfect execution. What I'm about is perseverance. What I'm about is, is the effort ongoing. And this is where it's crucial to keep encouraging them to try. And the minute you start pointing out the, all of the things that are wrong, believe me, I tried this. I tried this a couple of times. I can tell you from personal experience, it does not work. Keep them encouraging them to try. If you see them not trying, fear is at work work to get that out. Hey, it's okay. Let's go in there here together. Let's figure this out. You can do it. You've got to keep encouraging people to try. So I'm going to kind of close with this. And then I would love to open this up to a conversation. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Ed O'Malley at the uh, Kansas Leadership Center in Wichita. Leadership is mobilizing people to make progress on difficult challenges. Leadership is an activity, not a position. Anyone can do it. Anyone can lead anytime, anywhere. It's just making the choice to engage people. It starts with you and you have to engage others to be a leader. You can't be sitting and waiting for them to call you. You have to have a clear purpose. And I didn't really go into that, but I think the people in this room, so to speak, kind of have one. And there's nothing that works every time. And you're going to, it's risky, and you're going to have to experiment your way into figuring out what works in your case, in your organization, with your people. There isn't a single blueprint or a single path that's guaranteed to work every time because the starting conditions are different, even within subgroups within an organization. Now, I kind of want to close with kind of reiterating my context here, all this works in, this is, this is the principles to apply in as a, especially an internal change agent in an organization that I'm going to say is, is big enough to hire an, ex, an internal change agent. So a few hundred people and up. If you've got an organization where you got, uh, you know, a, a business owner with 25 or 30 folks, he can, that, that business owner, he or she can make change pretty fast, but the, me the mechanism really there is to engage that business owner, to engage that ownership, to engage that top level leader, because with, they have, they have one-on-one -on -one relationships with everybody in the organization. And if they're not on board, it's not going to take hold at all. So it's a little bit different application there, but now you think of this perhaps as engaging groups of businesses rather than engaging individual businesses. If you're an external consultant, if you're, uh, I saw Brian Lagas on here, if you're in the MEP system, this is a, a way to adopt this approach to those kinds of situations. So with that, I would love to open this up to dialogue to questions and answer them. I see Q and A on there. Now I got to figure out how to how to read it. There it is. Awesome. You okay. good, Mark? Uh, I think so. I'm just going to go top to bottom. Okay. Um, so I have I have Ron. Uh, culture change. Team members teaching other teaching each other rather than forcing through the innovation. Uh, what you need is change from bottom up and change at the top. That's ideal. That's absolutely ideal. And if you have a large organization, um, you can actually get uh, make a lot of progress. And all I really need is at the in the C suite that they don't do anything that stops me. Now you 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 reach a limit, obviously, 
but uh, you can make a lot of progress. And as a change agent, go in there and say, you're here to learn everything you can and to get your reps and to get your practice engaging people become a better leader. And that's a skill you can take anywhere. Um, let's see, we have, we have a team whose project developed lean templates and put it out there for people to use. Can I talk about a bit about that? Um, so I'm not sure what a lean template is. I can, I can make a couple of guesses. Um, what I would say just based on the context is that the, um, I'm just skipping around on me, is that, um, where did I go? Okay. And it's moving around on me. <laughs> um, that if it's a, if it's a, if it's a, like a, a structure, kind of like a scaffolding, it's a starting point, that's probably good. But don't try to engineer the whole system at once. Go in and start with where, what their issues are and work on solving the things that bug them. And keep flow in mind, keep in mind where you're trying to go. But if you're to, to say we're going to do lean because we want to be lean is really, really hard because you come right back to, okay, great, but why? Well, it makes things better. Yeah, but how? Well, people make fewer mistakes. Well, exactly how does that work? And you can start going down a rabbit hole of trying to answer all of these questions. So templates and blueprints tend to cover the mechanics, but you've got to work on the... Um, You've got to work on the interactions between people and how are your templates working to increase the richness of the interaction. That's really the key to be looking at. Um, all group employees looks look like advice. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm looking for other, any other questions here. Cross-cultural environment, this is Gabriel. Cross-cultural environment, each team member comes from a different country, language, any thoughts? Um, if you put them together and get them working, um, you can overcome a lot of that. Uh, diversity is an awesome thing. Um, people what gets people building trust is familiarity. So if they're, if they're working together on a common, physically together, working on a common, common problem, you can break down a lot of that. And that would be the first, first place I would work again, is working to build teamwork, working to build mutual trust. Um, and performance appraisals for leaders who are responsible for results. It's the metric should always be used as a wrench, not a hammer. Yeah, Deming, uh, Deming had a pretty good comment uh, for performance appraisals, which is stop doing them. Um, and that's a, um, you know, that's, that's a bit extreme, but let's look at the, let's look at what that, how you've got to look at how does that mechanism work to engage them? Uh, metrics is is an interesting one. People will make the numbers. Um, there's a great uh, book I just read about uh, really the downfall of General Electric. Um, and if you look at what was going on during the Welch era, it was all about making earnings numbers specifically. And what they had was subunits were saying, okay, we're not making the numbers. How do we close the gap? and literally making adjustments to the accounting system so that the numbers would look better, so that they could report good earnings to corporate, but they haven't actually brought in more money. And you can see where that takes you. It's, it's, it's good for a little while, but not for long. And I've seen that for myself in other organizations where the metrics are, um, especially when they're financial outcome metrics or outcome metrics in general, and that's all there is. Um, uh, my friend Skip uh, puts it really well. People will make those numbers. They will do it by changing the system, which is what you want. 
by distorting the system, which is not what you want, or by distorting the numbers, which is very much not what you want. So, you know, not sure your position in the organization, but getting fear out is a tough one. And if the, if your, uh, if your efforts for change are going to push those numbers in the wrong direction, you've got to understand that first and you've got to understand exactly where those numbers come from and you've got to understand the accounting system and you've got to understand how the accounting system is going to respond to the changes you're making and if you work really hard to not surprise anyone and work really hard to meter it in so that there's an opportunity to to not slam the system all at once then you've got a better shot at it other than that, we have to kind of look at the specifics. And then what's your thought on a repository of templates so those can go grab and go? Okay. Um, I don't, I, I guess I would be skeptical about that just uh, un, unless it's, unless you're dealing with people who are really in the, uh, on the far left of the curve, who are, um, really eager to learn and are the ones who are going to go pick up the books and pick up something and then work to tinker with it and figure out how to apply it in their specific organization. Uh, just having that repository, it's my prediction is it will likely sit there and you'll put a lot of effort in that I would prefer you spend engaging people directly rather than writing, writing a lot of that stuff down. But again, I would love to see the uh, see the specifics, and maybe uh, maybe you've got something there. It's hard to say right now. Okay, what about the situation? I have three people. The target is sixty, and the first five hours they made forty on average. Oh, that's classic. Okay, so I'm assuming you need to get sixty uh, units a day out, or sixty units in five hours. I'm not sure. It sounds like you're not making rate. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to suggest here is go find. Pull it up here. I'm going to pitch Mike's book here, the Toyota Takata Starting Guide or Practice Guide, and in the chapter on uh, um, process analysis, he really takes you through step by step how to get a sense of the cadence of output and how to look at that cadence of output versus the uh, the cadence you require, which is your attack time and your plan cycle time. And you can start down the road of systematically solving the problems. Um, if you want to talk about that situation specifically, we need a lot more information. But what I would encourage you to do is hook in with uh, a hook in with the Toyota Kata community because they deal with that a lot. And uh, I have a whole nother webinar I do on exactly that. Uh, we don't really have time to get into the nuts and bolts here, but the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is think not in terms of how many do I need to make, but the rate at which we're making them. So what's the cadence from the time one comes out until the next comes out, until the next comes out versus what does that cadence need to be? And what gets in the way of indexing that line one by one at the rate that you need? So five hours, 60, that's what, 100 and that's uh, um, 10, 12 an hour. So 12 an hour is one every, uh, one every uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, or five minutes. So if, are you getting one out every five minutes or not? And if you're not getting out one every five minutes, then what's in the way? And that's where you start that process. Okay, I think I went through everything. Did I miss anybody? Mark, from what I can see, I think you've hit them all. Okay. I know I just kind of blew through this. I, I really prefer it when people can talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the hourly goal. Okay. So uh, 60 an hour. Okay. So 60 an hour is uh, one a minute. So if you're trying to get out one a minute, um, get a stopwatch at the end of the line. What are you actually doing? Averages can get in your way because they might be they might be crushing it for part of that time and then not doing anything for another part of that time. So don't look at averages in this case. Look at the pace of output and build a run chart of 
this one came out, okay, then how, then uh, 58 seconds elapsed. I got the next one, 48 seconds, the next one, 65 seconds, the next one. Uh, and see what that looks like versus what you need if you're trying to get out 60, uh, 60 an hour, you need one a minute. And then start going from there. What gets in the way of that happening? How much variation is there first? Work to stabilize on that at whatever that time is, and then you can start looking to take things that take time out of the situation. Again, that's a whole, I just gave you like potentially uh, weeks of coaching in 90 seconds there. Hey, Mark, um, someone asked for the book name again. Oh, Toyota Kata Practice Guide by Mike Rother. Um, so Toyota Kata is a, is a community of practice. Uh, and you can find lots of stuff out there about it. Um, I'll put a plug in for kata-school-cascadia.org, which is my little organization here in the Pacific Northwest that uh, actually we have uh, uh, every Friday, we have 30 minute Zoom calls to ask and answer questions. So maybe hop in on there and uh, see what you can learn. But uh, this is a book that uh, Mike Rother wrote, which is a nuts and bolts on uh, how to, um, how to, how can I put this? It's, it's really the process of how to develop good problem solvers in your organization and how to develop people who can coach people to learn to be good problem solvers. In a nutshell, that's what it's about. And I think that is all we have. All right. I'll hang around for a little bit. If anybody has some lingering questions, you can also, uh, my website is theleanthinker.com. I'll actually put that in the chat. Uh, oh, nope. Hosts and panelists, everyone. Okay. So thank you to everybody who attended today's webinar. Mark did put his information in the chat. So you are able to email him with any questions that you think of along the way. A reminder, you will receive a link to view the um, recording within 24 to 48 hours. And, oh, um, Mark, do you mind putting the link in there for the Kata community? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, rain cramp. So that'll be in the chat as well for anybody asking. And Mark, thank you again. All right. Glad to be here. Looking forward to seeing everybody next month.